was the year 1265 and a Swedish farming village was facing a crisis. They hadn't had any rain for almost two months. All their crops were dying or dead. Many of the citizens were actually starving. One day, Sven came bursting into his kitchen. He scooped up his wife, Helda, held her in his arms, and he started dancing with joy. Sven, what's gotten into you? Why are you so happy? Helga asked. My darling, I've just spoken to Rudolf. Sven replies, you know Rudolf. He's the one with the head of fiery red hair, big bushy red beard, and he says we're going to get four inches of glorious rain by tomorrow. Oh, joy, all of our problems are solved. Sven beams at his wife and just looks at her, and she just slaps him. What would you slap me for? Oh, Sven, you've gotten my hopes up. Why are you so confident in this Rudolf fella? Sven beams at his wife because everyone knows Rudolf the Red knows reindeer. <laughs> well, some of you will catch on. <laughs> what can make you happy? <laughs> you know, for some people, the Christmas season is absolutely full of joy and anticipation. For others, Christmas season is actually a time of depression. It is sadness. It's even dread. Today, as we continue our series of sermons regarding one man, Luke, to one man, Theophilus, all about one man, Jesus, I want to look at a very large portion of Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 80, where we read of at least four people or groups of people who rejoiced and why they rejoiced. But first, let's start with prayer. Lord, I am thankful for your love. I'm thankful for your blessings. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to find reason to rejoice in the Christmas story. Help us to see why others were rejoicing and how we can rejoice too. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me begin by reading from Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 39. Now at this time, Mary set out and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed or happy are you among women, and blessed or happy is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed or happy is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what the Lord has spoken to her by the Lord. Right away in this passage, I see what I would call the joy of Elizabeth. She's excitedly greeting Mary when Mary arrived to visit her. Luke records for us that what initially spurred Elizabeth to this great joy wasn't just seeing, Elizabeth, uh, seeing Mary. What spurred her on first and foremost was the very fact of the joy of her baby inside of her womb. Verse 41 simply reads that the baby was leaping in her womb. Verse 44 explains it, that the baby leapt for joy. For joy. This baby, whom we'll know later on as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, inside of Elizabeth, has leapt for joy upon the greeting by Mary. And I know that these pregnancies, the pregnancy of Elizabeth and the pregnancy of Mary, are very special pregnancies. They are divinely miraculous events. But I cannot help but notice how that John, who hasn't yet been born, is first of all called a baby, and second of all is attentive to the Lord and the Savior coming into his room, and third, he jumps for joy. When I hear people going on about a woman's right to kill her unborn baby because it's not really a baby, I can't help but go back to the Christmas story. Because in the Christmas story, we see the Holy Spirit of God inspiring Luke to write about how this unborn child is a baby, that it is human, it has emotions like, like a joy, and it even has abilities that it could leap inside the womb. Elizabeth immediately noticed her baby leaping in her womb, and from my wife and other women who've experienced pregnancy, that probably had to hurt. My wife often talked about when the baby would kick against her ribs or kick against her bladder, which was even worse, you know, kick against her in different places and how much pain it was, whether it was the back or the ribs or the bladder. And, and I keep looking at this. I wonder if it hurt Elizabeth when this happened. But it doesn't deter her from becoming joyful and crying out with a loud voice, blessed, happy. 
It was spurred her on, it was spurred on by the fact that the baby leapt within her womb for joy. And it made her so excited that when the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth, Elizabeth began crying out with excitement about who Mary is. And her excitement isn't just because, well, Mary's a relative. I mean, always that, that's always fun when you have a relative come over, especially when it's our kids or our grandkids coming over. That's a time of excitement. Her excitement, though, isn't because it's a relative. Her excitement, revealed by the Holy Spirit, was because of who Mary is. Happy are you among women. Happy is the fruit of your womb. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, knew immediately that Mary isn't just a relative, but Mary is now pregnant, and she is the mother of our Lord. And notice how Elizabeth points out that Mary is already the mother of our Lord, not just, well, she's going to become the mother of our Lord. The Holy Spirit revealed to Elizabeth that the child inside of Mary's womb was a child and has already made Mary into a mother. And it's not just after birth, but as important as birth is, Mary is considered a mother while she's pregnant. Happy. Happy now. The Holy Spirit revealed to her, Mary, how special she was. She gave Elizabeth reason, or the Holy Spirit gave Elizabeth reasons to rejoice. The Holy Spirit also revealed that the baby inside Mary is who this baby is. And for this reason, Elizabeth was also happy. So she was happy not just for who Mary is, the mother of our Lord, but she's happy for who Mary's baby is. Even without Mary informing Elizabeth about the visit from Gabriel, who had informed Mary that the child she would conceive in her womb would be from the Holy Spirit and would be the son of the Most High God, Elizabeth already knows by the power of the Holy Spirit what this child is going to be. I wonder whether or not this let Elizabeth know that the child would be God in flesh, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But I'm very certain that she knew, she as well as her husband, Zechariah, would have known the prophecies regarding the coming Messiah. I'm pretty certain that Zechariah had revealed what Gabriel has told him about their own child. I'm certain about that because when it comes time to naming the child that Elizabeth gives birth to, she immediately says his name is John. When they argue with her, they give a tablet to, to Elizabeth and he writes John as his name. So I believe he's communicated things to her. I'm pretty certain that she has let, uh, Zechariah has let Elizabeth know how special the child is that she's giving birth to. But I'm sure they also knew the Old Testament prophecies that when there was one coming to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the Messiah would be coming very quickly. I'm pretty certain she understood this. And, And maybe not from Zechariah, but maybe from the scriptures or maybe just simply by the Holy Spirit power. And she had to get that information. And But right here, Elizabeth is filled up with the Holy Spirit to let her know that the child that was growing inside of Mary, that this child was the promised Lord, the fulfillment of the prophecies and the hope of Israel. And so there's much rejoicing on Elizabeth's part. She is rejoicing about the baby leaping. She's rejoicing about who Mary is, the mother of our Lord, rejoicing who the baby is, that this is the Lord inside of her. There's much rejoicing. And then we go on to verses 4. 46 through 56, and we read about the joy of Mary. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regard for my humble state of the bondservant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is to generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has given help to his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, just as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary stayed with her for about three months and then she returned to her home. I find it very interesting that Mary's response to Elizabeth's joy is her own praise to God and her joy is based in God. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. 
in God. I find this extremely interesting because I can't remember any time when I've had family or loved ones or good friends come over and the very first words coming out of my mouth is I'm rejoicing in God. That's not my first response when family comes over. My first response is, hi, good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. How was your trip? How are things going? That's normally how I greet when family and, and friends come in from a long distance. And there's hugs. Can I help you with something? Can I carry something in for you? And that's normally what it is. I don't start out with my rejoice. I rejoice in my God, my Savior. And yet that's what she does. When she hears the praises by Elizabeth, she just immediately goes to, I'm rejoicing in God, my Savior. My soul exalts in the Lord. It, my spirit is rejoicing in God, my Savior. I've often wondered just exactly what has happened between Gabriel, who, when he spoke to Mary, and now Mary has arrived at the house of Elizabeth. What all has happened? Did Mary tell her parents before she took off? Did she tell her parents, hey, I'm going to be pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit? Did she tell Joseph who she was betrothed to? How long has it taken Mary to get down to Elizabeth? Did Mary travel alone? If she wasn't alone, who traveled with her? I mean, at that time, women, especially young women, did not travel long distances alone. What all did Mary think about while she was traveled? Did she have some good friends of her that went along with her that she could talk with and, and share about things? I often wonder about the background to the arrival at the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth, especially when you see this reaction from Mary. These praises to God. I mean, Mary had to be an absolutely remarkable woman to react as she did, pointing out that my joy is based in God. Rejoicing in God, my Savior. Exalting in the Lord. And then Mary goes on to point out that their joy is not just based in God, but it's deepened by what God does. She starts out declaring that, the Lord, that God has regarded her humble state as a, the Lord's bondservant so that future generations will consider her blessed or happy. God isn't just a God of the past, but a God of the present. He's caring for someone that most people probably would never have ever noticed. In fact, how many of us would have known about Mary if it weren't for the Christmas story? Uh, did Mary have any brothers and sisters? We aren't told anything like that. None of them are named in Scripture for us, but many families had a lot more than just one child. Mary would have been just as insignificant as her siblings, if she had siblings, because God hadn't selected them, and Mary would have been the same way if God hadn't selected her. And Mary is rejoicing that God could see her in her humbled estate and use her individually. When I think about this, I find joy because it reminds me that God can see me. God can see you. He sees you. He knows about you. He cares about each and every one of us, not just as a group collectively, but as individuals. Humble, insignificant, individuals that God can choose to do great things in. And then she bases what God can do by what God has done. And her joy re continues by remembering what God has done. At the beginning of September, Brother uh, Derek Voorhees, president of Boise Bible College, came down. He spoke at our 50-year celebration here at Valley Christian Church. His main thought in his message was pressing forward by looking back at what God had done. Look at what God has done, the many great things he has done for this congregation to keep it going so that we could be worshiping God. And if we look back, we can see his hand working in us. We can look ahead and have confidence he's going to work in the future. And that's what he was, his whole me message was basically about, that we can look back at God and what he has done so that we can have hope for the future. Mary must have understood this. She looked back to see what God had done, the great things, the mighty things. He had shown them mercy. He had brought down the proud. He exalted the lowly. He filled the hungry. He gave help to her, her nation, Israel. 
and looking back to see God's greatness and power gave her great joy so that she could look forward in the future that God is going to continue in the future to care for us just as he has in the past. So we see Elizabeth's joy, we see Mary's joy. And then verses 57 and 58, we read about the joy of the loved ones. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors, excuse me, her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. I love how her neighbors and her relatives gathered around uh, Elizabeth to rejoice. And it gives us basically two main reasons. First of all, they were rejoicing because God has mercy. I am not certain that all woman, women would consider it the mercy of God if they finally were able to conceive and give birth to a son in their old age. I mean, there's jokes about doctors uh, curing an, a woman of hiccups by announcing to her, well, we understand you're pregnant. And, and she goes, oh, gets scared and runs off and hiccups are cured. The joke to an elderly woman that she's pregnant is probably more scary than considering great mercy of God. But Zachariah and Elizabeth have been praying for a child even into their old age. They were praying that God would open up Elizabeth's womb, that he would let her give birth to a child. And Jared pointed out that when he preached a couple of weeks ago how Elizabeth kept herself from people for the first five months of her pregnancy. But we aren't told why. For, but the last portion of her pregnancy, she's no longer hiding it, nor does she want to hide it, as she is apparently was realizing their prayers were answered and, and now she is pregnant. God has blessed her to become pregnant. He has shown her mercy to let her be pregnant even in her old age. And I find it very impressive that Zachariah and Elizabeth and their neighbors and their relatives could so all see that the birth of this son is a sign of God's mercy. I find that impressive because some of us would not have seen that as mercy. We would have looked at that as some untimely joke of God that he's playing on us. But it makes me pause and think, are there things I have prayed for? Hoping to receive the answer immediately from God, but God's answer came much later. And if so, did I consider that God being merciful? Or did I consider it too little too late? I must confess that I have sometimes failed to see the mercy of God in answering my prayers when they weren't answered in the time I was hoping to have them. But I'm impressed with Elizabeth, Zachariah, their loved ones. They all could see God's mercy in answering their prayers and giving Elizabeth a son in her old age. I pray that we can see God's mercy in the prayers that we pray, when God answers them, not the moment we pray them, but much, much later, will we st still see God's mercy. I also want to point out that the loved ones were happy because Elizabeth herself, she was rejoicing. They were rejoicing with her. I think about how <clears throat> some of the women who could have been there might have also been childless. I mean, most people try to gather around friends that have similar issues or similar problems. And if Elizabeth had been childless all these years, she might have gathered around some people who were childless, some other women who were childless, and now they're seeing Elizabeth rejoicing because she's pregnant, and some of those women could have been going, like, that's not fair. What about me? Why am I not getting that way? But it tells us that they can't gathered around her and they were rejoicing because she was rejoicing. Are we able to rejoice with others when God shows them mercy and kindness and it doesn't feel like we're receiving mercy and kindness? Are we able to rejoice when God blesses someone with blessings that we ourselves have not received? That's something pretty hard to do. But we need to be able to rejoice with others when they are rejoicing. 
And so we see the joy of Elizabeth, we see the joy of Mary, we see the joy of the loved ones, and finally, in the bulk of this passage, in verses 59 through 80, we read about the joy of Zechariah. I'm only going to read a small portion of this. I'm expecting you guys all to have Bibles or get Bibles online, you know, use your phones and find it. But I'm going to start in verse 59. And it happened on the eighth day, this is after the birth of John, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zechariah after his father. And yet his mother responded and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. And they made signs to the father as to what he wanted him called. He asked for a tablet and wrote as follows. His name is John. And they were all amazed. And at once his mouth was opened and his tongue freed and he began speaking in praise of God. His praises to God started as soon as he could speak. I honestly can't imagine what Zechariah's life was like for roughly the nine months that he could not speak. I have lost my voice on many occasions. Normally it's for a week or less. But Zechariah was unable to speak from the time of his visit with Gabriel, the angel, until the birth of John and eight days later when he gets named John. And at that point, after Zechariah has confirmed that the son should be called John by writing it on a tablet, his mouth was again open, his tongue free to speak, and the very first things that comes out of his mouth are praises to God. You know, that's what our mouths are really created for. If you read James, he writes about how some people use their tongue to praise God and then curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And he says, that should never be. See, our mouths are used to be praising God. It's what they were created for by God, that we would praise Him. In heaven, according to the book of Revelation, that's what people are doing and will be doing. They will be giving praises to God. They will be singing new songs of praise. They will be crying out, holy, 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 exalting the God of creation for all eternity. And that's what our mouths were created to do. That is what should be our speech is being used for, for praising God. I realize that some people are absolutely embarrassed to sing. Some people have been told, oh, your voice is terrible. You know, you don't, don't sing, it's awful. My dad was one of those people. He had choir when he was in high school, and his choir teacher looked at him and told him, I want you to stand up, I want you to look outside. Do you see that basketball goal out there? If you shoot baskets the entire time of choir, I will give you an A. (laughs) That's how good my dad's voice was. So he, don't ever, you would never want to play horse with my dad. He was really good shot. (laughs) He shot a lot of baskets. Uh, But you know, that's one of those things. Some people have that feeling, and they, they go like, oh, I can't sing, I can't sing, I don't want to sing, somebody might hear me. Do you know what? God created your voice, your mouth, to praise Him. And so when we're singing songs of praise, go ahead and sing. Remember that when you are singing, your audience isn't everybody else. You need to realize you have an audience of one, that's God. And we are praising Him. Use your voice to praise the Lord God. And Zechariah was happy. He now had a son. And once he was named, Zechariah's joy came out through his voice and he started praising God when he could finally speak. And then as you read verses 65 through 75, you can see that Zechariah's joy, his thanks are for what God is doing. That God had visited them. He had accomplished redemption for his people. He raised up a horn of salvation for them. He spoke to them. He has shown them mercy. He remembered his covenant with them. He granted them deliverance from the enemies. And just like Mary, just like Mary, Zechariah found joy in remembering what God has been doing in history for the Israelites and for them individually. You know, we just went past Thanksgiving. One thing I always like to do when it gets close to Thanksgiving is I like to go back through all those old prayer concerns. Go back through them and look at all the things we've been praying for in January and February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, into November, and then look and see what all God has done. 
Look at how God has answered prayer. And then I like to look and, and see how many new faces do we have at Valley Christian Church and see how that God is still actively working in the tri-state area. And, and I like to spend some time looking at some of the people in the church and trying to think about how they have grown, how that a year ago they were afraid to talk in the church. They were afraid to pray out loud in the church. And now they are stepping up and they are taking some leadership. And all these things, let me give thanks for what God, is doing in this area and in us. It all helps me to bring joy in my heart. And I hope you do the same kinds of things. Zechariah praised God when he could speak again. He gave thanks to God for what God was doing and his joy continues in what will happen. What will happen. Starting in verse 76, Zechariah changed from simply looking at what God has done and now he is suddenly looking ahead, especially at the meaning of this special son that has been given to Elizabeth and Zechariah in their old age. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins, all because of the tender mercy of our God. And Zechariah could see with full confidence who this baby child John was going to be. That he was going to be the fulfillment of Malachi chapter 4's prophecy. Just as Jared brought it up just a couple of weeks ago. The prophet who was coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord to restore the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the hearts of the children to their fathers lest God comes and smites the land with a curse. Zechariah knew that this child John was fulfilling prophecies. He was coming before the Messiah, before the Christ. And he knew and he trusted in what Gabriel had told him. And he had absolutely full confidence that God always keeps his word. Do you trust what God has said? What God has prophesied? Are you praising God because he has promised one day he's going to send Jesus back to this world to take us home to be with him forevermore? Are you rejoicing in what God has done in sending Jesus the first time to die for our sins so we could have forgiveness of sins by his blood? Are you rejoicing in what God is going to do when he sends Jesus a second time to bring about the reward to those who know him and punishment to those who reject him? Are you finding reason to rejoice as God has always kept his word and he continues to keep his word and he will keep his word? If we can rejoice in that, we are doing well. Let's rejoice in our God. Lord, I am thankful for the rejoicing that we get to see in this passage and I ask, Lord, that you would help us to have the same joy. A joy in seeing what you have done and what you're doing and what you're going to do. Let us trust you and know that things are going well in your hand. Sometimes it's not according to our plans. Sometimes it's not even in our timing. But Lord, help us to see your mercy, even if it takes a long time. Sometimes I have prayed in the past that God would, you would send Jesus today. And that didn't happen. Help me, Lord, to see you're still showing mercy. Mercy to me and mercy to others because you do not desire for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. Thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.